Hello and welcome to the Django DRF, the Django REST framework and React building a simple blog API series. So this is another step-by-step -step series where we're going to build a Django RESTful API application. And then in addition to that, I'll go through the steps, and this is obviously optional, I'll put this at the end of the tutorial, where we'll go through and build a React application at the same time to consume the API. So this is the first tutorial in this new series. So we're gonna go through some of the basic theory to begin with. So this isn't a comprehensive overview of all the theory. I just wanna to start to introduce you into some of the different concepts and terminologies so that we can get to the program and you'll have a basic idea of what's going on. Once you've done that, and again, that's optional, you can skip that, have a look at the timeline in the description. So once we've done that, we get into the actual program and build a new project from scratch, going through building the applications, initial configuration and so on. And then we start to build and test the model that we're going to need for this application. So once we've got all that in place, we can then install DRF, the Django REST framework package, and then we'll have a look at API view. So initially we're gonna start with utilizing API view because that's gonna allow, allow us to visualize our API, to test some basic elements of our API and understand how to use the Django DRF package in a little bit more detail than if we didn't have a graphical user interface to help us. So we'll go through uh, creating new data, saving data, visualizing data, uh, and then we'll also use, and I'll introduce you to Postman, which is a piece of software, it's an optional piece of software, you don't need it for this series, but it's handy if you want to test your APIs. So while we're building the application, at some point, I'll go through some of the DRF generic view classes, just give you an overview. This is gonna be really helpful for you to decide which class to use based upon your situation. And then finally, we'll do some testing for the Django REST framework. Once that's all done, we'll then move across to React and then start to build our React application to consume this new API that we built. So I've bolted this on to the end of the tutorial because some of you might not want to do this. Um, so the Django product that we make is a standalone application uh, so that you can just learn that if you want to. So like I said, you don't need to do this bit if you don't want to, but if you want to learn how to potentially utilize this, here I've selected React because it is probably still one of the most popular JavaScript frameworks there is. So let's go through and create a new project. We're gonna be utilizing Material UI for this to add some front end to it. And then we're just gonna implement that in this scenario or this tutorial, consuming the API using the pure React tools. So this again is, we're gonna be building upon this each tutorial and adding the new functionality to it. So generally what's gonna happen is that we build something onto the Django framework, a new feature, and then we go to the React application to have a look at what we're doing or how to consume or utilize that feature. So for those who want to, I'm just gonna go over now some basic theory, really just an introduction to these different technologies here. So API, REST, error codes, statefulness, and endpoints. So in my opinion, these are kind of basic underpinning knowledge that's useful to understand before you start utilizing or building RESTful APIs. So let's just take and familiarize ourselves with the traditional web paradigm. We have a browser, a user opens their browser, they type in a domain name, they send a request to a server. That server has all the web pages stored on it. Maybe it's connected to a database it would deal with that request and send, send the web page back to the browser. So I wanna put this picture in your head. I know this is a little bit um, out of context here potentially, but I just want you to think about mobile applications. So a mobile application, you download the app from the app stores and then that application has everything that you need to view the app, to play with the app and so on. So it has all the data, has all the screens, all the views or whatever you want to call them so that you can see the application, go through every single step or look at everything within that application. It's a standalone piece of software that's installed on your phone. So the only thing that's missing from that application is probably the data. 
So we couldn't put all the data, we could probably do that, but we couldn't put all the data um, for that application within that mobile app. Uh, else that application could be rather large. Imagine, um, for example, you downloaded a weather application. So we can't store all the weather data about every single um, day within that application because things change. We want our data to be dynamic, right? So um, what this application probably has, this type of weather application, has a connection to the internet. That connection is probably connecting to a database which is holding all the weather data for that particular um, item that the user wants to access or the place in the world that they want to show the weather. So as the user or the owner of that database uh, collects more data, they update their database with that new weather data. And then that then just connects to the mobile application whenever the user wants to see more weather data. So this is a paradigm which we can now implement on the web using technologies such as React or Vue. So React, for example, is a JavaScript framework where we can build almost whole applications and have them downloaded, not in this case to a mobile application, but to the browser. So think of mobile applications again, you download the mobile app to your phone, everything is stored on that and you just need the data which then connects to some sort of data source online, for example. So similar situation with React, we can work this way, it's not the only way to work, but we download the React application from a server. Um, so we might go to a website, just to give you a full picture, we go to a website, we type in blah 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 dot com, we then, it looks like a normal website, but what's happened is a React application is downloaded to your browser and we can now see the web page. So the one thing that's missing potentially from that is the data. So again, we've got a similar situation here. We've got the React application now here, for example, in our browser, but now we need to connect to the database. So a common theme here, whether it be a mobile application or React or view application that we download to a browser, is that we don't want these applications to connect directly to our database. So if you had a database with data, you wouldn't just give out access to anyone because that's a very dangerous thing to do. Anyone could then go in and then just start doing whatever they want. So you want some way of trying to control how people and what people can do with the data in your database. So generally, there's just a few things you want people to do with data in your database. You either want them to add data to your database or maybe update data in your database, or in some cases, be able to delete database data. Okay, so we were just to fill in the gaps here now with this situation. So we changed mobile phone to React application. So imagine this React application is in the browser and now we have a RESTful API service. So just think of this as an application that we're going to develop, in this case in Django in this series, whereby we can basically set out and control how users can connect to the database and what data they can access and how they can access and control and manage that data on the database. So this is just kind of an intermediary kind of piece of software that's going to control how people and manage how people can connect and access your database data. So these two items here, the React application that we're going to build and the Django RESTful API, these are the focus or this is the focus of this series. So we're going to be looking at how this actually controls the access to the database, how we can set up Django to do that. We're going to have a look at how React can connect to the server and uh, we'll have a look at authentication. So for example, we can control who can access the database data um, based upon access control or, or levels or potent, depending on what person is trying to connect to the database. Maybe we have um, levels of users. So different user types can do different things with the data because obviously we don't want everyone to be able to delete all the data. Some people can delete some of the data maybe. So we want to be able to control that. So the benefit of using web APIs is that there is a lot of data online that we could connect to. 
So we're not limited to just connecting to one piece of data. Using other RESTful APIs, we can connect to multiple data. So in this situation here, we basically we build our React application and install it or put it onto a web server. So someone types in our domain name, goes to our website, and then that React application gets downloaded to the browser. Okay, so now it's in their browser, they can now see the application and so on. So all the data that's in the application will come from REST, RESTful APIs somewhere on the internet. So for example, we could connect to a RESTful API online, which has a database about the weather, and we could then utilize that on our application. Similar, we may have a social login authentication RESTful API, um, and we could then utilize that within our application. So if we were to look at the traditional web paradigm again, here we're kind of stuck with one web server serving the data from a database, um, and that goes back and forth. So the traditional view, we didn't really have access to all this other data. It was very difficult to access all the other data, whereas in today's web, we have multiple data sources, and we ultimately or potentially want to utilize that to um, make better applications for users. So at this point, although I wasn't very direct, hopefully I've given you an overview, I've planted a seed, so you kind of understand what um, API or RESTful API um, is. So here I'm specifically talking about web APIs. That There's different, um, this terminology API can be utilized in different contexts for sure. So here I'm just talking about web APIs here, a service that allows you to connect to data uh, access data and return it on your website um, to for you to then to utilize it in however you want to utilize that data. So REST, representational state transfer, or REST or RESTful web services or REST API, these terminologies are very interchangeable. Um, I'll try and be consistent in utilizing RESTful API. Um, but maybe sometimes I'll just say API, for example, in this series. So I'm referring to the same type of thing. So just to clarify uh, what's going on here, we've got, and we're going to build our React application, which is going to be accessing our RESTful API, our Django application. Our Django application is going to be configured to connect to a database and then serve or return data from the database to the React application based upon the user type, so if it's an admin, they may be able to access more data than a normal user, for example. So here, what's happening is that we connect our application to our Django RESTful API server. That connects to a database. And the data that gets returned typically is in a format that other applications can understand. Because one thing I've not mentioned here, and although I gave you an example, is here we're using JavaScript to um, take in the data from the database. Now, if you think about a mobile phone application, that's probably using a different language. So another useful thing to know about a, a RESTful API service is that the data that we turn, return from it can be utilized in any language or any platform because the data that we return is going to be in this generic JSON or XML format. And that type of format can be utilized by any programming language. If you're not familiar with JSON at this point, it's probably worth just stopping here and just typing it into Google and just learning a little bit about it before you move on. So I don't cover it here, um, but you will get a general flavor of it as we go through this series. So hopefully that kind of shores up a little bit more there about what REST is or RESTful web services are and what they do and how they work. So let's talk a little bit about this request here. So the user makes a request. So here we are working on top of HTTP. So let's just have a look at what HTTP can do for us or the requests that we can make. So let's remember that when we go into our browser, uh, we type in a domain name, we are making a HTTP request. So we're requesting some sort of data from a server and we're telling or giving it an instruction to say, hey, look, we've gone to this domain name. Now we want to request from you the home page. So with HTTP protocol, there's a different, there's a differing amount of request methods or instructions that we can send to the server based upon what data that we want or how we want that data. 
So for example, here we could send a get request. So this is a really basic request. Typically to summarize this, for example, you want a web page. So you send a get request to the server and say, look, um, can you get this web page for me? HTTP colon hello.com slash about us. So it gets that web page. Um, we've also got post. So if we want to send data to a server, we send a post request to that server. We say, look, here's the data. Now we want to send it to you. And this is a post request. So the server is expecting to see some data because it's a post request. And then maybe the server deals with that data and then sends uh, a reply back saying, oh, thank you very much. I've got that data. I've saved it to the database. Um, let's move on. And you can see here some of the other request methods as well. Um, again, there's a good website if you're not familiar with mozilla.org, developer.mozilla.org. Uh, you can find this information easier there and just read about these different elements. So this is really good background reading to understand what's happening in the background. So we, you will use some of these. And again, through the series, you'll become familiar with get and post and delete, for example. So this, like I said, is a real underpinning knowledge and um, which is useful to understand if you have not experienced or seen this before. So some other underpinning knowledge which is helpful to understand is HTTP status response codes. So again, we've got this scenario, um, any scenario here, we've got into our browser, we typed in a domain name, we send a request. That might be a GET request, traditionally, Typically, that might be a, a GET request. So we requested a web page. The web server then gets that request from our browser and then does something with it. Now, sometimes there's problems. So we need to be able to, or the web server needs to be able to send a message back to the browser to say, sorry, I can't find that page, for example. So this is where the HTTP protocol comes into play because it has all these facilities that allows the web server to interact with the browser in a, in a way that both technologies understand the language. So we're using the HTTP protocol. So the browser understands the HTTP protocol, the web server understands the HTTP protocol. So it's a standardized way of communicating. So HTTP has status response codes. So as it suggests, status response codes are codes that the server might send back to the browser to indicate if there's a problem, for example. So here, for example, are a series of different response codes that the server can generate. So for example, a 200 might be a successful connection to a server and a web page gets sent back. Um, if we wanted to post some data to the server, um, the server could send a 201 status response code back, which is a created response. So the browser knows, hey, we've created it. So now you might be able to see, for example, that if the server is sending a response back, it means that on our front end, we can then capture that response and we can then do something on the front on the page to indicate to the user that um, that it's been created in this case, so 201. So if we received a 201 response back from the server, we might have something appear on the screen to say, yes, you've just created some data and it was successful. So you can see here that 300 are redirections, 400 codes are client error codes. For example, you may be familiar with the 404 not found page. So if you went to a domain name, uh, a domain address, blah.com slash whatever, and that page didn't exist, likely that you would get a 404 error. And then a 500 error, a server error. So these are types of errors that you might see um, when your program hasn't been coded correctly and you're not doing or not utilizing correct code or you're sending the wrong information to the server, the server isn't able to process it um, correctly. That's typically where in this series you might see a 500. So I will try and point out these response codes and we will need to understand them to a degree uh, to better uh, debug our code and also uh, test our code. Okay, so let's just summarize uh, RESTful APIs, or at least what would um, be the characteristics of a RESTful API. So um, here I'm talking about um, a RESTful service. So we're gonna be building a Django application, which is going to be a RESTful API service. 
So in order for us to clarify or classify our application as a RESTful API, there's a few different conditions that it must meet. So for example, our RESTful API application we build must have a base URI. So this is a point of entry into the system. So here, for example, HTTP colon slash slash x.com slash API. So we use links like this to direct um, users to data. So that's gonna, that's gonna come um, a lot clearer once we start building our application, but we're gonna be utilizing uh, traditional URIs like this to actually point to different data in our database. So I'll give you some more examples later, but just keep hold of that for now. So HTTP methods, so we're gonna be utilizing, or RESTful APIs would be utilizing or um, be required to um, have the facility to utilize get, post, put, patch, and delete. So RESTful APIs should have these type of um, services available. And again, I'm not providing much detail here, um, but I've kind of mentioned what get and post is. So for example, if we wanted some data from our database, we would need the base URI. We'd send that to a RESTful API service, our Django application, and we would also send a, a get. So we're saying we want some data, so we'd send a GET request to the server, and then that will return data. So it's just a P, an instruction to the server or our RESTful API to let it know what we want to do or what type of service potentially we want. So next thing, it's stateless. So I'm going to explain this in a second, but RESTful APIs are stateless, like HTTP. So you could stop now in actual fact and just uh, read what stateless means. Um, but I will briefly un give you an overview of what that is in a second. But that's another characteristic of a RESTful API. So also RESTful APIs include media type. So to define the state transition data elements. So basically in a RESTful API, we can define what type of data we want to send across. So this is a, a critical feature of a RESTful API, because like I said before, typically RESTful APIs will send back data from the database in, in a format that's useful or can be used by any programming platform or language. So this is one of the real values of utilizing a RESTful API in that we can return data and we can utilize, imagine we wanted to build a website and then we wanted to build a mobile phone application. Well, we wouldn't need to worry about our backend because that's just gonna be pumping out JSON or our data in JSON format, which we can definitely utilize on our web page and also on our mobile phone application. Maybe we wanted then to extend it to a desktop application. Or well, again, it doesn't matter because we can still receive that data in JSON format and use it for that application too. So let's just talk briefly about stateless protocols or statelessness. So what this is essentially saying here in this situation is that when we connect to our RESTful API service, our Django application, we're gonna send a request. We're then gonna receive data from our service. We then make another request and then we return some more data. So every cycle here is completely independent from the previous one and it's stateless. So we don't remember by default anything that's happened in the previous request. So we request, we receive data and then it's just forgotten. Then we request again and then we receive data. So we don't store what's happened previously. It's a stateless protocol. So this is important to remember once we start talking about um, authentication, once we start in our React application here, connecting to our RESTful API, it means that every time we make a connection to our RESTful API, we need to authenticate ourselves. So every time we send or ask request data from the RESTful API, we need to actually also send some sort of authentication signature to tell the server we are who we are. So if you do come from a web background and you understand the principles and idea of sessions, you'll know that traditionally, for example, you would authenticate with a web server 
the web server would create a session. So it would create a state in the web server. So for example, when you go to the web page, you log in, it creates a, a state, a session state. So now what you have is that the browser can then, or the user can go to any of those pages and the session can be checked every time they go to that page to see if they're logged in so that they can access different things on the web page. We can remember who that user is and they can stay logged in. So now in this new situation here and that we're developing, the RESTful API doesn't store that session or additionally doesn't store that session. What's happened now, the state, this session state is actually moved across to the React application. So what we're going to do in the React application is we're going to build a, a login facility to our RESTful API, and then we're going to need to store the session or the state in our React application. So if we don't store the state in our application here, then every time we make a request, we're going to have to log in again. So what's happening here is that our React application is we're going to create a, a login facility. So they're going to log into the server and then the server is going to send them back, for example, some information that they, the React application can then store in state. So every time they make a request, every time the React application makes a request to the server, it's going to use that information to authenticate with the server. And then the server can then deal with or the request based upon the authentication status. So at this point, you may not understand anything that I've just said. Please don't get discouraged. We will go through this step by step as we go through this series. Hopefully you can return back to this uh, much later on and have a better understanding. And this may make more sense to you. So the last item I want to just quickly discuss is something called endpoints. So I'm going to be utilizing endpoints or talking about endpoints. So if you're familiar with web pages, which no doubt you are, normally it contains a link to a resource. So for example, here, http site.com slash blog. So that's a web resource that you connect to. And obviously then you'd expect to see a page for the front end for a blog. So RESTful APIs have endpoints, which really is the same type of principle. So here, for example, if I wanted to access user one's data, I would need to enter my uh, entry point here. Remember we had this entry point into our RESTful web service. And then I'd then select user and then maybe the ID of the user. So this is a, an endpoint which I'm going to build. So our RESTful API service, our Django application, We'll be able to take this request and it will then be able to turn it into a SQL query, which we could then query the database and extract the user from the user database, all the data about user number one or ID number one. So that's how we can interact. And this would be an idea of an endpoint. If we wanted to collect all the information about all the books, maybe we build another endpoint where we connect this URL here to a query, which is going to collect all the books from the database and then return it back to the user. So these are what described as endpoints. So users type them into the browser or utilize them in their API. And then those get turned into essentially queries to query the database, to return the data back to the user, that specific piece of data. So in that respect, respects, you can see this is an important um, point to understand and to look out for endpoints. But again, this is just something as we build, um, you'll see what's going on. But hopefully by dropping in this um, little bit of knowledge here, you'll build this connection as we build endpoints and you'll have a better understanding of what endpoints are. So remember that the data that we return is going to be in JSON format, which can be then utilized by pretty much any programming language. I will just add on to that and say that we have endpoints and we also now have this facility potentially to um, deal with endpoints in a different way. So for example, take this endpoint again, site.com slash API, that's our entry point into our API system. And then we have user slash one. So here we're going to collect 
if we send a get request, that's going to get all the information about user one and maybe send it back to the React application. Now we can also send a delete request. So we can use the same endpoint to perform multiple operations. So if we sent or we sent a delete request to this endpoint, that could indicate the fact we want to delete the data and not get the data. So there's two things here potentially to understand the fact that we've got endpoints and request methods. So we can use different request methods on similar or the same endpoints. So we'll watch out for that as we develop our applications. And again, I'll provide you examples of this, but that's just something that I just wanted to point out. Thank you very much for listening to that theory. Hopefully you've learned something there. If you haven't learned anything at all, then maybe, just maybe in the background, your brain has soaked in some of that information. And as we code, it will then start to be drawn out and you'll better understand what it is that we're doing. For new developers, I think it is good to have a general understanding of what is happening to then better understand what the code is doing for us. Otherwise, we end up just coding for the sake of coding, but we're not really knowing what we're doing. So having that basic understanding can definitely support our process and our understanding of the code in a more effective way. Okay, so now we're going to move over to Django and start building our RESTful API. So I'm going to start from a new folder. If you don't want to follow this part, then just move over to the next section. So let's just go ahead and create a, a new folder for this project. Uh, I've got some folders here. So let's just create a new folder called DRF. And then we go ahead and we're just going to create a new virtual environment for this. So we're going to need the M switch here. And I'm going to make a new folder called VMV for a virtual environment. So that's going to make a new folder with our virtual environment in it, in our DRF folder. So that should take a couple of seconds. And then what we're going to need to do is just activate our virtual environment. So PY, oh, I'll do this right. And uh, no, it's a, uh, we need to go into our folder. Inside of that folder is a folder called scripts. And then inside of that folder is gonna be a folder called, or a file called activate. So we just activate that and you can now see we've activated the virtual environment. So now we can go ahead and actually pip install Django. So that's just going to install Django. And then from there, we can then actually build a new project. So that'll take a few seconds. Um, okay, so once that's done, uh, we'll now go ahead and, sorry, I can't zoom in here. Uh, we'll now go ahead and create a new project. So we can do that by utilizing the Django admin tools. So we'll say start project. And then we're going to call this project core. So this is going to be our core. And I'm going to use the dot, the extra attribute here, a parameter, so that it installs or creates the project inside of this folder and not inside of a new folder. So I just prefer to work that way. You might see others working in new folders. So I just work that way. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can now see we've got this new core folder. This is our main Django folder with the settings file in it. And we've got our manage pi file now. So now we've got our manage pi file. We can now go ahead and run a start app. So we're going to create a new app. So our first app is just going to be called blog. And then what we're going to do is then we're going to make another app called blog API. So the point is here, or the, uh, the theory here is that we create a new blog application. This is going to have the model for the blog and so on. Maybe you want to serve this individually on a web server. So we could do that there. And then our blog API is going to just manage the API for the blog. So this is going to be an app where we just manage the API. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we have two applications here, one blog and one blog API. So now what we need to do is just connect this all up. So we're going to be utilizing some URLs for the blog and the blog API. So we're just going to connect that from the core. So in our core URLs, URLs, we just need to make some different uh, paths for that. So let's just drop that down. So we get rid of this here. We don't need that. 
So one thing we're going to need to do is use the include. So we add that in because we want to include some different files. And these are the two files that we want to include. So we create a path to our blogs application of the namespace of blog. And then we create a path to our API. Um, and we then create a namespace called blog API. So here we're just extending the URLs that are possible. Install that. So now what we need to do is just go into our blog and create a new file called urls.py. And then we can do the same thing here with the blog API urls.py and then we just need to populate them so in our blog urls we just need to create a few new urls here so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a simple uh, template view our class-based view here which is going to be just our home page for this service so this is something we just flesh out in the later tutorial but we're just going to build a simple home page here so that's going to need a template so we'll sort that out shortly no problem let's just go into our api here and think about some of the urls that we're going to need here so what we're going to do in this tutorial is we're going to build two endpoints so remember this is our endpoints this is our api endpoints so two endpoints we're going to be utilizing post list and post detail so these are going to be our our two views that we're going to build one of these views is going to take in a primary key. We we'll call that detail create. And then one of these um, views here is going to take in the name or take in nothing at all. And that's going to be our home page and that's going to be list create. So essentially what we're doing here, we're taking making two views, one view to show all the data in our database and one view to show an individual component or object in that database so we're making posts remember here so this is going to show all the posts and that's going to show an individual post so that's all the urls that we're going to be utilizing so if that doesn't make sense don't worry we'll move back um, over this i just wanted to get some of this um, groundwork out of the way to begin with and then we'll look back at it in a minute now i'll go through the flow as we develop each component so in the settings um, as you might imagine, we're going to need to just add these new apps. So we had the blog app and then we also have the blog API app that we created. So those are the two apps that we built. So let's just register those. And now we're probably ready to then just build a new folder. We we'll do this in the um, directory here. We're going to call this templates. So this is going to be our template directory and inside of here I'm going to create a new folder specifically for our blog and then inside of there I'm going to create a new file called index that's just our home page this is just a um, a template so we can see the index of our our server I'm just going to write index there so we know that's the home page um, so if I go back into our URLs so remember here that our template name was in the blog folder in our index or our index page. So this view here, this class-based view, is just going to display that template. That's pretty much all it does. So you can see that the there's no need for me to make an individual view here. This is all built in here to this template view utilizing the path. So now what I need to do is just go into my core and settings, and I just need to define the template directory so this directory here needs to point to my new folder that I just made. So to do that, I'm going to need um, the base directory and then the folder templates. So I just specify the base directory, which is the base directory of this project, and then a folder called templates. And everything else will just extend from there. So if I go back into my URLs, it's just going to extend from templates into blog folder and then the file called index. So now let's just go into the server server and um, we're going to run the server. You can see that we've got some problems here because we can't find some of the views. So at the moment, that's not going to work. So let's just go into our blog API and our URLs. Let's just remove that for now. I try that again.
Okay, so now we should be able to go into the browser and we can see our template is working. So at least our server is working, our template is working. Uh, so let's move on to the next stage. So next up, we want to go into our blog and now build a model. So our model here is going to be a table in a database that's going to store all the post data. So our API is going to serve post data to the React application. So we're going to make a React blog application. So we're going to make all the posts inside of this database here, or we're going to create a model so we can store all the post data. So let's go ahead and do that. So first of all, let's just import some things in. So we need to remember that the post is going to be associated to a user. So user is going to make a post. Therefore, we're going to use the user model. So we import that in. And also when we make a new post, we want to just timestamp it. So we're going to utilize the time zone. Now we're going to build a category for this. So each post is going to be part of a category. So if you follow the build in a simple blog series, we are just essentially using that database just to cut down version to begin with. So we've made a new category model here. It's just going to have the name. So we're just going to have a category um, with a name. So Django view, blah, blah, blah. That's going to be the name. It's just a character field with a max length of 100. And here we're just returning the self name. So this is just a string representation, a default string representation um, that we're going to show uh, just to identify the item that we're currently showing from a database, for example. So we're going to have it set to the name. So there we got our string representation of the data. And now we're going to build a new model um, called post. So now we need to flesh out all the different items in here. So what we are going to do is we're going to need the category. So we start off with that. So let's uh, bring in the category. So the category is obviously going to be connected via a foreign key to our class here or to our model here. So we're going to use protect here. So I don't want it so that if we delete a category, we also delete all the posts in that category. So in actual fact, most categories probably won't ever get deleted. So I'm using protect here to ensure that if anyone tries to delete any categories, it has no effect on the post. And in actual fact, it won't allow you to delete the category in this case. So I'm using dot protect. So now we want the title and the excerpt. So let's put that in. So we've got the title and the excerpt there. So just a character field and text field. And then we've got the content, which is again going to be a, a text field and then the slug. So here I'm going to create a slug. It's probably not needed at this point, to be honest. Um, so I'm not going to explain why that is, but later on in the project, we might utilize that. So the slug, essentially the URL, so um, we can slugify the title so that we can utilize this as a way of identifying each post. So instead of using the ID, the unique identifier for each post, we can use the slug of the um, post to identify and collect the data. So more on that later, if you're not familiar with that. And then obviously we want to know when it was published. So this is where we use the time zone uh, that we imported in. So we just get the time for that or the date that the post was published. So that's going to fire off every time we create a new post. So next up, we're going to have the author. So remember, we brought in the users um, at the top there. So we're going to utilize the author here. So we've then got another foreign key to the users table. So that's what we brought in at the top here. So you can see we're using cascade. So this is going to, um, in this case, if a user has made a new post, then obviously the user is connected to that post. Now, because we're using cascade, it means that if we delete any user, it's also going to delete their posts that they made. So again, this may not be the best thing to utilize in this case, um, but I'm just going to use that for now. And then we want the status. So we're going to have a post status like we did previously. So the post can either be in draft or published. So sometimes we create a post and we don't want to publish it straight away. So there needs to be a facility where we can put it into a draft mode so that only posts that are showed 
are flagged as published on the website. So let's just um, bring in some options. So we build some options for this. There we go. So we've got two options, draft and published. And you can see here that we're using default published, but we are using choices. So there will be a drop down facility potentially available to select draft or publish when we initially make the post. Or maybe later on, we want, may want to change the post from publish to draft. So next up then is the, we're going to create a, a new model manager. So let's just go ahead and in our posts, we're going to create a new model manager. So what's going to happen here is that by default, we want to return the data from the database. Now imagine you go to your homepage and then it outputs all the data. So we want to filter that data initially so that we only display posts that are published. So we create this custom manager here. So by default, if instead of running objects all on the data when we make a query, we can run post objects. And that's then just going to utilize this filter by default to collect all the data and only select data that has got the status of published. So if it's flagged as published, then we're just going to return published data only. So that just allows us to not have to filter out in our view data that isn't published. So we're just managing that within our model. Okay, so now we've got that, we then can just specify the different model managers. So let's just, the objects is gonna be the default model manager that we can utilize. And the post objects is the custom manager. So that's our custom manager. And then by default, we want to uh, display the data either in ascending or descending order by published. So we can define that. So when we return the data, we can descend or we can have a data returned in descending order based upon the published, that's the date, remember. And then we just want to then just follow that up with our string representation, our done to string method here. And that's just gonna return the title by default for any data that's returned. Okay, so we'll see that in the admin section. Okay, so that's now our model. Um, hopefully I've given you an overview of each section and why we're utilizing it. This will scale as we go through the project and we add more functionality. So now we can go ahead and just migrate this. This should work. Um, you can do a dry run if you want to, but I'm pretty comfortable that this is going to work. So we'd run a um, make migrations. And then we just uh, then commit it to our new database. Now we are just using a MySQL Lite database here. So we migrate. There we go. So now we have our new database right here. Now we can, I kind of got a module I think installed so I can open up the database and see what's just happened. So this is all the database tables that we've just made. In addition to our blog posts, we've also made all the authentication Django backend authentication tables. So our blog post, you can see has all the um, fields that we just created here, but notice in addition, it adds by default an ID. So this is a primary key, it says there primary key, not null, so it has to be populated. And this is a unique identifier for each post item in our database. So every time we make a new post item, this will auto increment, so the number would increase. So when we make our first post, the ID will be number one, when we make a second post, it would be number two and so on. So this will just keep auto incrementing in the background and that will be connected to each and every individual post. So before we go any further, I'll just bring to your attention, there is a file here called commands.txt and any commands that I've utilized, I've tried to just put into this file here if you're not familiar with Django or you're new to Django. So that'll just help you remember some of the commands. So you can by all means have a look in there if you're not too sure, if you just forget some of the commands. There we go. So I mentioned a dry run. So you could have utilized the dry run switches here and the verbosity of three. So that just gives you a little bit more information if there's any problems. When actual fact in this case, if you run the verbosity of three, it will actually show you what is actually being created or what is, yeah, what is being created. So dry run just um, mocks up or go through a, a initial migration in this point, but it doesn't actually apply. 
So you can see if there's any problems before you actually apply the migrations for real. So on that point, we are now going to install the Django REST framework. So this is going to give us the tools and facilities that is going to allow us to convert our Django application into a RESTful API. So let's go ahead and install that. So that takes a couple of seconds. Now we need to go into the core and settings. So here is where we're going to need to just uh, add it to the installed applications. So go ahead and add that in. So just rest underscore framework. So now we can actually build our RESTful API. So let's go back to our URLs in our blog API. So I did put them back and I deleted them just to start the server. So here we are then. So here we have two access points or endpoints, sorry. Um, one for showing a detailed view of the post and one for showing just all the posts. So what we're gonna need to do is now create a view for each one of these. So let's head over, head over, to, head over to the views and have a look at what we need to do here. So we are using class-based views here. So first of all, we don't need the render. So let's just get rid of that. So first of all, we're going to be utilizing some of these generic views from the REST framework. So we bring those in. And then in addition to that, we're also gonna need the database from the blog. So we need to reference that and bring that in. So blog.models and our table was called post or a model was called post. And then in addition to that, we're also going to need some, to build some serializers. So let's just bring that in for now. And we'll also then just create that file. So in the blog API, let's create a new file called serializers.py and we'll explain that in a minute. So once we've got that in place, we now build our first, first view, which is going to be um, our post list view. And then we're also going to need a view for the post detail. So we'll do, go ahead and do that. So these are two views here. So you notice that we're using the generics and then we're creating or utilizing list create view API and retrieve destroy API view. So these are quite descriptive in what it was going to provide. So here you can see we're going to be able to list items and create items. That's essentially what this view is going to provide us. And this view here is we're going to retrieve and destroy. So retrieve being getting an individual item and destroy being we'll be able to delete the item. So these built-in uh, views, there are a few of them in the REST framework. If you haven't visited the website, the Django REST Framework website, so we're using this package here, um, you'll be able to go into the tutorials and there's some great guidance here on different things. So we're using generic views here. So there's some more examples here if you want to have a look at some more examples or extend using different attributes, etc. But what I've done is I've just extracted some information for you. This is from that service or that website. So I put it down here. And you'll see that these are all the concrete view classes that you can utilize. So we're using these here. So list create view. So let's have a look at that. So used for read write endpoints to represent a collection of model instances. There we go. So these are all the different um, views that you can utilize. So by all means, just have a quick read of those. And I'll, we'll go over some of those in a second, test some of those out. So if you're familiar to class-based views, this is going to make complete sense. If you're not, then it's not gonna to make too much sense to you, but I'll try and explain what's going on here. So this list create view here has behind the scenes, all the magic um, that is gonna perform all the different operations that we need to list items and create items. All we need to do is tell this view a few different things um, to get it working properly. So in actual fact, what we need to do is we just need to build a query set. So we need to tell this view the fact that we want to use this data here. So remember, we want to list all the items. Therefore, we need to go into the post database. We then just need to use the objects all. Now, what we can do, if you remember, is we created a, a custom manager called post objects. And we can access that through under the lowercase post object. 
So let's go ahead in our view and we can put that right there. So that's going to return all the posts that are currently flagged as published. And then in addition to that, we also then just need to tell the view about our serializer. So what's happening here is we create a serializer, this file here, and then what we're doing, we brought it in to our project file here, our view file here, and now we're just pointing to it. So let's talk a little bit about serializers. So to understand serializers, it's a fairly simple process. Let's just go for a high level view of this. So our React application might be a mobile phone application, might be a desktop application. So it might be use, utilizing PHP, Python, and so on, so different languages. Now we want to make sure that the data that's returned from the database is in the right format to actually be able to be viewable to our application. So we're going to format eventually our data potentially into JSON format, and that can then be utilized by any programming language. So if we try to summarize what a serializer does, it allows data, such data from query sets, for example, and models to be converted into Python data types that can then be easily rendered into JSON. So serializers is the way of actually formatting different types of data. Because remember, it might not just be JSON data, and there might be different types of data, but it allows us to basically convert the data in our database into a easy, understandable way so that we can then render it into JSON and then pass it back to our application. And remember, the benefit of utilizing JSON, for example, is that it can be utilized by multiple languages, multiple platforms. So the essence here of our serializer, what we want to do programmatically is just define what data we want to serialize, what data we want to get from the database or save into a database and then return it in JSON. So what we need to do is from the REST framework, it provides us serializers package. So we import that in. And of course, what we're going to also need is our database. So we then import our model blog models um, so we've got our blog here, we've got our models. So we import all that data in or allow access to the model. And then we're just going to create a new class for our post serializer. So let's do that. So we've got post serializer. So we're extending from serializers model serializer. And then what we're going to do is then create some meta class meta. And here we're just going to define two things. So we want to first of all define the model, which is going to be post in this case. So our post table, and then we're just going to define what data we want to manage and utilize within the post. So if you remember, we've got ID, title, author, excerpt, content, and status. So notice that in here, I'm not defining some items. One of them being, for example, the time or the date it was created. So you could also add that in if you wanted to and so on. Um, I've just omitted it in this case. So um, that basically just defines what data in the model we want to work with. So we now have the connection or we've now built, excuse me, in the blog API, we now have that connection. Our serializers are connected to our list create API view so that we can then potentially collect all the data from our database and then have it all translated into a format which the front end can understand. So it will need to work the other way around potentially because we need to get the data um, from our front end. So React would send data across to our um, RESTful API service if it wanted to save some data into a database. It would send it across as JSON. So we need to translate it the other way as well. So we get the JSON data and then we need to translate it in a way that we can then save it into the model. So we've got our serializers class. So that's all in place. So now you might expect us to be able to connect this up and start the server. So let's go ahead. So go ahead and start the server. So manage pi run server and let's go ahead and see what this looks like. But before we do that, in actual fact, let's just remember our endpoints. So let's remember that our entry point here is 
if we have a look in the core in actual fact, in our URLs, we made an entry point here of API. And that was our entry point to our API system. And then we extended that in our blog API with the, if we type in a number, that's going to give us an individual post. If we don't type in anything, that's just going to list all the items that are in the database. And of course, we don't have any data yet in our database. So let's go ahead and now type in slash API. So that's going to take us to this page here, um, which I'll explain what this view is in a minute. And you can see here we haven't got any data. But what it is telling us, it's using HTTP 200 OK, which means we're able to access this page, which is great, or access this data. It tells us allowed. So this is get post head and options. So these are all the operations that we can perform on the data. So I haven't mentioned head or options at the moment. We'll do that later on when it becomes important. Let's just focus on get and post. So get is a request that we can make to get data from the database. And post is a way of sending data to the server to actually then potentially store it. So let's go ahead now and just create some new data because we should now be able to post some data to our database from this view. So at this point, if you do add some data, you'll notice that the author is missing. There's no drop down items here. And that's because we're not actually created any authors yet. So if you were to try and post this, in actual fact, it won't work because it says here or returns this field is required. So if we go back to our database in our blog API, or sorry, our blog and our model, you remember we created this foreign key here. So we're expecting some data to appear here in order for us to actually save an entry into the database. So in actual fact, what we need to do is just make a, a user. So we go ahead and just create a new super user. And we can do that by typing in pi and manage pi and then create super user. So this is essentially just an admin user we're building. So I type in admin and then blank and then admin and admin. And yes, so that just creates a super user called admin. So what we can do now is just go back to our server and what if we refresh the page, if I just go back to this page, you can now see we have an entry here. So in actual fact, now we can go ahead and we can just add some items here. So we just populate this, the excerpt, and we can status needs to be published to show it. Press post. And you can now see we've got a foreign key constraint failed. Okay, so why might that be? So I do think it's important to have as many errors as possible. Um, I promise I'm not making this up because you're bound to get errors and problems. So integrity error. So it does clearly identify the fact it's a foreign key constraint failed. So somewhere we've got a foreign key in our model that needs to be dealt with and that we're not dealing with. So there's only two here. We've got the category foreign key and we've got an author foreign key. So if you read the code previously, I didn't mention that I left the category default to zero to to zip to one. Sorry. So in actual fact, the problem here is that we need to identify the foreign key and there's only two and we've already dealt with the author. The category is trying to default to number one or category item number one. And it, we haven't actually built category number one yet. And this is what the problem is. So let's just go into our admin of our blog and let's just make sure that we can access our category. So we haven't actually built a view for a category yet in our API system. So we just need to do this manually. So let's just go ahead and we we'll just create a new admin script here. So this is going to register the two models that we have in our models file. And this is now going to be available on our admin page. So let's just go back, go into the admin. Just log into our admin. And now we can see the category and post table. So let's just add a category. So I'm going to add the category Django as the first category. And that's going to be ID number one. So in actual fact, by default, if I go into the models, all items that I publish will have the default number one, which is going to be Django. So it's going to be automatically assigned to that Django category. So now let's just go back into our API. And let's just try this again. So the title, we we'll use this post here. So this title is going to be that. And then we're just going to use this text here. 
So excerpt content and the status is going to be publish. So this time, hopefully we can post and there we go. So if you get to this view, it means that all your code is working correctly. We've now added items into the database. So we can check that by going to the, uh, we can go to our admin again, we've just opened up a new link here, go into our posts and you can now see we've got an entry here. And remember this is ID number one. So that just clears up hopefully where this ID comes into. If I make a new post, that'd be ID number two. So these are unique identifiers that we can utilize to access individual posts. So I guess that's what we're gonna do next. If you remember, we also had a second endpoint, which was where we needed to type in an integer number. So if we go back into the blog API in our URLs, we now have this ability to type in a primary key, a number one or an integer, and that's gonna then fire off this view. So this view here is then going to now access or get one item from the database. So now we just need to tie this up and finish it off. So we need obviously the query set. So let's bring in the query set. So objects all, and then we need the serializer class. So we bring in the serializer class again. So we're using the same serializer class because it's the same data that we're using. Here you'll see that we've basically we're going to collect all the data and then we're going to filter the data out based upon the ID. So we save that and then we go back in to our browser here and now we can just type in an ID. Now we know that our first post has an ID of one. So if we wanted to see that, just type in one there, press enter and now you can see this individual post. So not much has changed really here, um, but notice this is gonna give us an overview of what we can do here. So allow is get, delete, head and options. So we don't actually have facilities here to create a new post, that's only available here. So that remember is being controlled by our view. So this is list create API view, and this was retrieve and destroy. So let's just see if we can now have the option when we go into here, because this should be retrieve and destroy. And notice that we've got the delete button here and that's the destroying option. So let's just go ahead and I'll just show how these are interchangeable. For example, maybe we just wanted to uh, list, no, retrieve only. So maybe we just want to retrieve the post. Well, in actual ca case, we just transfer or just change this into retrieve. Now, if we go back and refresh this page, the delete option has disappeared. So that's how you can initially control what access or what um, can be conducted or what can be processed or what's the word I'm thinking of? What can be done in each of these endpoints by just adding one of these different view classes. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense by reach read through some of these and that's gonna give you an idea of what um, view you might use per different endpoint. So now what we have, I just wanna tackle this API view. So we've already seen it, so there's no real no need to introduce it that much. But you can see here that if we use the API view, that gives us this graphical user interface. That's what we're seeing here. So in actual fact, we don't necessarily need to have this. This is really useful for developing your application. You can see what's allowed or what's available. Now, what you're looking at here is an endpoint. Let's remember that. So this endpoint will be utilized on our React application to get this data. The difference here is in this API view, obviously it just allows us to see what data is being returned in an easy, um, usable way so that we can just practice and learn about our API and check the critical items about our API to, to see if we can um, see the data and access the data in a way that's intended per different endpoint. So this is gonna be a really useful tool for us to learn a little bit more about APIs or learning a little bit more about the REST API in Django here. So now let's talk about permissions. Obviously a very critical part of this process. So, there are three places where we can add permissions. We can define a permission project-wide, or we can define a permission within our view. 
or we can actually define permissions per object. So we're now just going to go through and give you some initial information about how to apply those different permissions in those different places. And hopefully this will be the starter. This will some, be something that we would develop further in this series. But let's just go over the basics here. So first of all, the REST framework gives us an option within our core settings to actually define project level permissions. So here what we can do is define the project level permission. So by default, you might want to add the allow any. As you might imagine, this is going to allow access or give permission to for anyone to access our endpoints and the data, which isn't ideal. It's probably worth noting that we didn't actually have this in place and you notice that we could actually connect to um, our API anyway. We were actually logged in as the admin, remember, but essentially what happens if we don't add this parameter or setting to begin with, this is what happens. We have this setting here called anonymous user. So generally anyone can access our API. So that's what happens by default. So have a look at the Django REST framework and you'll notice that there are different permissions that we can set. So by all means, read through that. Here I'm in the API reference here. Uh, so next up then, we're gonna have a look at the is authenticated. So let's just now apply is authenticated here and we we'll press save. Now, remember we are logged in as the admin user. So you would imagine we can still access this because we are authenticated. Look, it tells us up here that we are actually authenticated. Now, so let's just go ahead and add or create a new incognito window. So if I go in now and try and access our endpoint, you can see that what we get here is a HTTP three, HTTP 403, which is the forbidden. So we aren't actually authenticated now to actually view our API. So you can see here that this is a project level um, permission setting that we can apply to protect our API. So in the second part of this series, we will tackle permissions in a lot more depth. For now, in actual fact, what we're going to do so we can connect to our application, our React application, is we're just going to move that back to allow any. And like I said, we'll move forward with permissions in the next tutorial. So next up, I just want to introduce you to Postman, which is a free piece of software that allows us to connect to APIs. So this was going to allow us to troubleshoot and test our API. So once you've installed, you'll probably be presented with this screen here. So click on this little tab here to get going quickly. And then what we can do is just type in the name of our, of our server, which is our local host, 8000 port. And then our endpoint is the API. So you can see what's happened is that we've connected to it. We've got our 200, which is okay. Uh, if you hover over it, it actually gives you information about it. And then you can see down here, we've got the data that's returned and that's the data that's in our database. So this is obviously just a simple view to begin with here because all we've done is created a simple get request, but eventually we'll go into the headers and the body and so on. And we'll have a look at and drill down to the, how the requests are formulated particularly when we start talking about security, and that will give us a deeper understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. So that was Postman. Like I said, we'll drop into that in each of the different projects that we run or different uh, tutorials in this series. Now we're just gonna focus on a little bit of testing. So if you head into the commands text here, we've got in coverage here that we can install. So let's just go ahead, stop the server. We're just going to install coverage. This is going to be a package that's going to help us. If you're new to testing, this is going to be helpful for you to identify what tests need to be done here. So if you're not interested in testing, you can just move to the next tutorial or next part of the tutorial. So now what we've got then, so we've got the coverage installed. Now let's remember that we're running a virtual environment. So I don't want to test that folder. So I've got this command here. It's going to omit that folder. So if you want to add more fol folders to that, you can do. So I don't want to test that folder. So what I can now do is run that command. And what I want to do is just test all the tests that are in this project. So if I run that in actual fact, there aren't any tests. So I haven't actually made any yet, but that's how to actually run the tests. So if you're new to this, that's how you run the test. If you're familiar with this, you can obviously drill down. So now what I want to do is just run some tests on the block. 
So what tests do I need to run? So the whole point of this coverage and why I asked you to install it is because what we can now do is run this command here and that's going to create a new folder called cov, HTML cov. And what we can do now is go down into here and go into this one here and um, open this up in File Explorer, or you can just open this up in your browser, essentially what's happening here. So I've opened up that and then I'll go and open this up with, you can't see this, but I'm just going to open this up with Chrome. There we go. So this is the result of running coverage. And you can see here, for example, um, my models here, it says I'm missing two tests. Okay, so let's go look in here. So if I drill down further, it then tells me what tests I need to run. So this is just an indication of some of the tests that you might need to run. So let's go ahead now and just build some tests to test this model. So back in my project, uh, I want to run these tests potentially from my blog. Now there is a file here called tests already, so I'm just going to utilize that in this instance. As we move further in this tutorial series, we'll change this about and put it into folders, etc. a little bit more structure. So let's go ahead now and create some tests. So I do have a testing series on this channel. Uh, I think we're into a couple of tutorials now. So we're just going to cover what we've already covered on those. If you wanted to drop into those and have a look. So what we need to do here then, so we're going to create some tests. So first of all, we're going to need to bring in the items that we need to test. So we start off by bringing in the user table. So we need that. And then we're also going to need our, our models. So that comes from the blog models. So we're going to need the post and the category here. So we do that. And now we need to create some tests. So let's create a new task class. Sorry. Uh, we're going to call that test create post. So we're good, just going to test to see if we can create a new post. So we can do that first of all by creating some data. So remember when we create tests, we're not actually building real data into our real database. We're going to create a test database automatically behind the scenes. And then we're going to then test on that database. We are still going to be using the logic within our project, but we're not going to be touching the real database. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is set up some data for this testing database. So here then I've utilized the setup test data. So I've created a new function called setup test data. And now what I'm going to do is just uh, create some data. So this is uh, one method of doing this at least. So here we've got test category equals category objects create name Django. So here you can see what I'm going to do is in the categories table, I'm going to make a new entry called Django. Right. So secondly, then I need a user. So let's go ahead and make a new user. So here I've made a new user called put this into a variable called test user one. So user objects create user. So I'm going to create a new user here called test user one and password of one, two, three, four to nine. So that's my user then created. And now I need to go ahead and I need to build some data. So let's build some data in our database. So that's going to go in our, in our post database. So here we got um, the post objects create. So we're going to give it an ID of one post title, excerpt, content, slug, author ID is going to be number one. Remember, we're creating a new author. And that's going to give automatically have the ID of number one and then status published. So that's great. That creates my new data for the database. So now I need to actually do some testing. So let's do some testing by first of all, creating a new function here uh, called test blog content. So um, let's go ahead and first of all, just set this up. So we're going to first of all define um, post and we also need the category. So let's just get the category item. So that's going to get the uh, post data and the category item. And then what we want to do is get the individual items in our database. So that allows us now to get the author, uh, excerpt, title, content and status, and we can reference it like such. And now we can actually run some testing. So now we've kind of got the data in place. 
we can now run some testing. So obviously our author should equal our post author, which should equal test user one. So our author for this um, post should be test author one. That's the username. So we can run a test here. So this assert equal. So the author, you see how that being matched up, should equal test user one. So we're just going to test to make sure that the data that we're inserting is the actual data that is actually inserted into the table. Some simple tests there. So it's uh, equals here, um, title, content, status, and you can see how we're bringing that all in. So next up, what we want to do is test our string method, our dunder method, because that's what potentially we've been told to actually test. So we need to test to make sure that the name that we're trying to access is also the name that gets returned or displayed. So the same thing will happen here on the post. So let's just have a go to make sure that happens. So we can just run a simple test here. So assert equals again, and we then test the string method. So the post that matches our model to remember um, that's what we are taking in. Let's go back to the test. So post, this is the post that we're referring to. So we want to check the string method of this post. There's only one post here um, that we're getting back and that should equal post title. So the title equals post title in our database. If we go back to our model, if we were to extract that from the database and view it, maybe in the admin, it should be referenced by the title, which is called post title. So that's what should be there in that Dunder method, post title, the name post title. Apologies, maybe the, the name in here is a bit confusing. And then we can do the same thing to the uh, category. So if we return a category item, maybe in our admin again, that should be shown as the category name. So in this case, we've made one category called Django. So we should return that Dunder as Django. Okay, so that's just some simple testing. So let's just go ahead and run this. Um, so run the tests. Now we're running this generic test here. So it's going to look for all tests in our project. You can see it's we'll run one test and we're all good to go. So let's just update our coverage HTML. Let's go back and then refresh this page. And now it says zero missing. So there were some simple tests that we conducted on our blog model. So if you wanted a little bit more information about testing on models, there is a model tutorial um, in the testing series in this channel. So go ahead and have a look at that if you want a little bit more detail. So what I showed you there and this method here may not be the, the best method of testing or setting up the tests here, but it's just a general overview. I try to simplify it a bit for new users. If you've not done any testing at all, hopefully you've got a general idea of what's happening here. So just to explain here, the assert equal, essentially there's two items here, isn't there? There's the item that, or the left-hand side, which is the item we should be matching. So the content should equal whatever the content is in the database. And then on the right-hand side, we're writing what the content should be. So in the database, in the first entry, the content is just called post content. So that's the content of the, this particular item. So that's what should be returned. So we're just testing what is returned is what is actually in the database. Apologies, if that makes sense. So we're just equal, that should equal that, essentially left and the right hand side. Okay, so now let's move across and test our API. So if we go into our API application and go to tests, let's now have a look at testing this. So this is gonna be slightly different. Um, so I wanna give you enough information to get started with testing but we don't go too deep into this. So we, what we can, what we have is some different facilities. We're using the REST framework, remember, and that now applies or allows or gives us some different tools to do some different testing on the API. So what we now have, um, or what we can now do is we can test a reverse of a URL. We can do that anyway, um, but we're going to bring that in. We're going to have a look at status. We're going to also bring in the API test case. So whereas before we're using test case, now we've got a specific tool for API test casing, testing, <laughs> test casing. Uh, now we have the blog model. We need to bring that in again because we're testing that. And we also want the user like before. So these are the tools that we're going to be utilizing here. Um, 
as we go through this series, we're looking to a little bit more testing and develop our knowledge. Um, you might be asking yourself a few questions here. What the hell is going on? Um, don't worry for now. Let's just move through this and see if this um, then opens up by adding some tests here. So we're going to create a new class here called post tests. And this is our, we're going to extend from our API test case here. So post tests. So we're going to test to see, first of all, we can actually make a post with our API. That's what we're testing. So uh, let's go ahead and just create a new class here called test view posts. So first of all, we're going to, in actual fact, just test if we, we can view the post. So um, how do we view a post? Well, we need to go to the entry point of our API. So what we need to do here is get that URL. So we're using reverse here to find out what the URL here is of our blog API list create. So here we're using blog API list create. So let's go back into our blog API, to our URLs. Remember we're using our app name so we can refer to, we can refer to it by blog API. And then we're looking for uh, list create. So that's what we're bringing back. We're bringing back this URL, which should just be slash API. That's essentially what's happening here. If I go back into my test, um, no. if I go back into my other tests, if I just close all this, what we're doing here is we're just collecting the um, string slash API slash. That's essentially what's happening here. The URL for list create. Okay. So now we've got that. Uh, we're now going to um, just test the response. So we create a response here. So we get the URL and we're utilizing JSON. And that's the format of the data. So here we're setting up a response. So we're using self client dot get. So client is a reference to generating or simulating a client. So simulating a browser. So that's what client is referring to. So we're using a client, a browser, and then we're going to use the get request. And then we're going to go to this URL, which we just created. That's what it's saying. And we're using the format of JSON. That's what this uh, command is saying or doing. So that's going to go to that URL. It's then going to check the response. Now, remember the response that the, we want to get. If we go back into our API, remember that the response we want to get is the 200 because that refers to, okay, everything is okay. That's the HTTP response here. Okay, so we're looking for 200. So what we're going to do now is just set this out. We're going to use the assert equals again. Remember, the left hand side must equal the right hand side. So on the right left hand side, we go into the response that's returned and then we get the status code. That's going to print the status code. In this case, hopefully 200. And then we want to match that up to a status HTTP 200, which is just obviously 200 code, right? So you can see why we brought in status now to access that. And you can now see why we brought in reverse and what that does. So that should equal 200. This on the right hand side should equal 200 if we went to that URL. That's what we're testing. OK, so if we test now, uh, let's go and test that. You can see that uh, one test is run. And only one test has been, or two tests, sorry, have been run. The two tests we just created, and everything is OK. Now we can test to see if that is not working. If we type it a one here, for example, and then run the tests again, let's do that. We should, uh, it should cause an error. There we go. So failed one error. And it tells us here that we were expecting, um, doesn't tell you what we're expecting. Oh, that's a response we're expecting here, but it tells you that we returned a HTTP 1201 and we should be receiving a 200. So we can see that's potentially um, working there. Okay, so now let's move on to another test. So now let's build a second test to test to see if we can actually create data for our API. So we need to, again, just set this up with the category and a, a user. So we go ahead and do that like we did in the initial test. And now we can go ahead and create some data. So we've got some key values here, title new, author one, excerpt new, content new, and so on. Now notice I haven't included category because our model, remember, by default, 
um, utilizes default number one. So I don't need to specify that. So here I'm just slimming this down to make it a little bit quicker and just really to show and showcase what you can do with testing. So here we've got the URL. So we're going to reverse the list create again. So we're going to bring back a slash API slash that's going to set out the entry point or the endpoint here where we want to send the data. And now we have the response. So self client. So we're going to simulate to client and we're going to post the data. So where are we going to post the data to the URL? What are we going to post the data that we just set up? And we're going to send that in format JSON. So now what we can do is we can test the response code. So what we do now is we use an assert equal again. So the response status code that's returned should equal the should equal a 201 created. So if that's correct, it would mean that the data has been inserted and everything is OK. So we can go ahead now and just test that. Just test that and that runs OK. And there we have some simple tests where we tested if data can be inserted into our API and whether we can also just access any data. So you might want to extend that to include all the views that you have and test all your views. Now, if we go back into the uh, settings here in our core, we need to remember that we have got allowed any. Maybe if you're using something else, um, for example, is logged in, that's going to be slightly different because we need to log in the user. So we'll look at authentication testing in the next tutorial, but just make sure that you've got allow user to run those tests, else the tests won't work. Okay, so just a final note on the tests. Um, so I tried to give you some examples, not comprehensive in any way, but hopefully um, new developers is aimed at new developers, just uh, trying to introduce you slowly into testing if you've not come across or started testing your applications yet. So hopefully that was useful. If you do have any questions, then please leave them in the comments and I'll always try and answer them. Okay, so that's the first stage done um, here for Django. So now we're going to cross over to the React application. We're now going to build a React application where we can uh, connect our application to this API. So remember that we're just using local host here. So there's a few items that we do need to add further along the line here to Django to allow connection. We'll do that shortly. But now we're going to start and build a React application. So go ahead and let's make a new folder for this React application. So I'm going to call this DRF uh, React. And inside this folder, I'm just going to open up this folder. So here we go. So similar, like before, I'll leave some uh, instructions here or some code commands so that you can get started. Or if you don't know the commands, you can just reference to them. So let's go ahead now and build our React application. So you are going to need um, for this build, you're going to need Node installed, Node.js. So download that if you haven't got Node.js already. This is a Windows machine. Um, so you'll be able to install it in any of the operating systems you have. So you can see here, I've got some commands. So we're going to start off by building a new React app called Blog API. So we we'll go ahead and do that. That's going to take a couple of seconds to create. And once that's done, we can then just CD change directory into this directory here. So then we can just test and initially run our application just to make sure it loaded and started correctly. OK, so once that's done, you can see that we need to CD into our new folder here. So then we can run the npm start command and that will then start the application in our browser. It would open up the browser and hopefully it should show the React logo. It should be spinning. There we go. So our application is created. So now we can go ahead and start to build our application. So I am kind of fast tracking here. If you've not used React before, um, I'll try and give you some information so you can get going. But there is an initial tutorial in the React series of this um, channel where you can go and have a look and just get some of the basics um, before maybe you start this. But like I said, you should be able to follow this. So let's go ahead and now just create some new folders here. Um, so we're going to create a component folder. So in our SRC, our main directory for our package or application, we're going to create a new folder here. I'm going to call this, um, oh, not templates, so I'm in Django still, uh, components. 
There we go. Uh, so we created this now inside of here. We're going to build a, a header. Um, and then we're also going to build a footer. So we're going to build a nice framework for this. So a new file here called um, footer.js. And then we're also going to need a post um, component to show all the posts. So we'll do that. Post or posts.js. We need one of those. And then finally, what we want to do, because we're using an API, um, sometimes the service might not be working very quickly. Uh, maybe the server's overloaded and so on. So we need some sort of initial page to show or initial template or component to show if the data is being processed or hasn't arrived yet. So let's go ahead and create a new file here. We're going to call this um, post uh, data um, loading. Or should we just call it post loading dot JS. Okay, so we've got some components there that we're going to build up. Uh, so you can kind of see what's going on here. So this is the situation. I'm not going to draw this out, but essentially what we've got here is a wrapper. So this is the index.js. So this is going to be our wrapper um, for our application. So inside of this wrapper, we're going to put the header and the footer. And then in the middle is going to be our components, our other components. So um, for example, our app component. Okay, so that probably doesn't make too much sense. So let's just go ahead and just delete all this and let's just uh, build this up. So what we're gonna to need to do then is import React. That's the first thing we need to do. Um, maybe self-explanatory, we're using React. And then our project is gonna need the React DOM. So we're gonna import that in. Um, and then we've got the service worker. So this server worker is an optional thing. I'm just gonna leave it here. So if you wanted to work, uh, your app to work offline, we would utilize this or change some of the settings here to be able to do that. Now we're going to need some CSS. So we're going to import the uh, index CSS, for example, here. Uh, this is the default code here. We'll just overwrite that shortly. So we're going to need that. And then we're going to be utilizing roots um, or, the, or a router of some sort. So we're going to import everything that we need there. So I'll explain that um, another point. Let me just uh, disable one of my uh, disable one of the um, uh, so we're going to need to disable if you have this running uh, beautify is going to need to be disabled otherwise it's going to mess up the code yep okay so I disable that otherwise it's going to just format the code incorrectly and then I'm going to be utilizing app so I import that and then also I've created a header and footer so I want to import that too. So these are all the dependencies. As we go through, I'll give you some more information. So what I want to do now is to formulate this wrapper I mentioned, which is basically going to be the structure of what you see on the page. So here, what I'm going to do is uh, create a new function here called uh, routing. And then I'm going to, first of all, uh, put the root tags in. And then I'm going to use the React strict mode. So this is going to give us some additional information for troubleshooting. And then what I need now is to actually construct the page. So this is just all um, peripheral stuff. So now what I want to do is actually construct what a user will see. So this page is going to be formatted and it's going to have a header at the top. It's then going to have some data in the middle. These are going to be the, from these components and the app component here. And then I have the footer. So that's how this um, is going to be constructed. Each page is going to be constructed. Each page is going to have a header and footer. If you're familiar to programming and utilizing the includes, etc., this is essentially what we're doing here, which is including the header. And then we're including this app called app, which is going to be our main entry point app, which we're then going to hook other components to. And then we're going to have the footer. So uh, the router here is a little bit abstract at the moment and reason why I'm calling it router, etc. cetera. Um, so you've, uh, no doubt you've got some questions why you're doing this. Um, again, this series, 
as and when we start using this more so, this will make more sense and that's when I introduce it. So if you could just go with this for now, um, you can see here we're creating this nice pattern here for our application. In the middle here is going to be our app. This is going to be our main application we're going to build up. Let's just get rid of that. And inside of here, this is where it's going to hook into these other components and show the other components. So there's a hierarchy here almost that we're building. OK, so this is the pattern of our application and hopefully this will make more sense as we build it further. So what we need to do now is just uh, build our header. So let's go ahead and build this header. Now we are using, like I mentioned, and we are using the material UI. So we're going to need to build or bring that in. And we're also using the React Router DOM. So we're, we need to import that in too. So let's just go ahead and add some of these dependencies. So the re React, React Router DOM, um, that's going to allow us to kind of set up some individual routes or connections to other components. And then the material UI, that's what we're going to use for our UI, for our interface, for our um, to make things look nice. Um, if you've not used material UI before, um, then this is going to be an introduction to that as well. So we've got our packages now installed that we need. So let's just go ahead and go back into our header. Right. So welcome to material UI. So by all means, have a little look. But this is a a, a material design tool. So it's going to allow us to design items or components on the page quickly by using pre-existing components or else this is just the equivalent of Bootstrap. If you're familiar with Bootstrap, it's basically a framework, a UI framework. So we can work from and build frameworks for our UI or build our UI in a really simple, super quick way. So there's pre-existing code here. So if I want to know how to build a list divider, I just need to follow the list divided code here and I can build very simple list dividers really quickly. Obviously, this is all connected to pre-existing CSS. So what this is doing essentially is just preventing me to have to write CSS or to, and to write the code for these different components that I might want on the page. If I go into the components, so uh, if I go into the uh, get started, there's some templates here. And this is useful because if you want to build a sign in page or a blog page here, you can just uh, utilize the source code to quickly build these components. And that's essentially what we're going to do here. So ours is going to be modeled from this um, pricing um, component here. So you can go into the source code and then have a look at it. Um, if I just zoom out, you can see how this is developed and built. So if you want to use components on your page from the material UI, you individually import them in and then you can then reference them in your code here. Um, for example, toolbar, app bar, and then that's how you're going to build the structure of your page. And obviously these items or components are connected to CSS that's pre-written, and that's just going to speed up the process of building your web page. So that's a short introduction there to Material UI. So let's go ahead now and actually build our header and see this in action. So this component is going to need our React again. And we can then also bring in some other items that we're going to need for this. So what we're going to need here is um, a few components. So I'm going to bring these components in. So we need the app bar, toolbar, a typography, CSS baseline. So go ahead and have a look at Material UI if you want to know exactly what these are. Um, but you'll get the general idea here. Now, I also want to use some custom styles. So I'm going to import in make styles here. To, so that I can utilize some custom styles. And then I'm going to go ahead and create a custom style. So I do that by utilizing this uh, function here or creating this function, use styles, make styles theme. And then I then create a new style. So app bar, essentially here, this is a class. If you're used to CSS, what I've done here is I've built a class and I'm overriding existing classes in Material UI. So what I want to do here with the app bar, remember I'm bringing the app bar in and now I'm going to overwrite the CSS or some of it by including a border at the bottom. So that's an example there of creating a custom um, style. Now throughout this series, we'll build many custom styles. So you'll get familiar with this. Um, 
We're not going to go into amazing detail, so you might need to kind of drop into Material UI, or else you can just ask me questions in the comments. So now let's just go ahead and create a, a new header function. Uh, so we're going to need some of that. And then what we need to do, because we're creating our own styles, we need to reference that. So let's first of all reference that. Um, so this is obviously referencing new styles here. So we're bringing in these classes. So these are essentially, like I said, classes that we're building, a CSS class. So uh, we then need to return. So we've got our classes. So now let's return. So this is the items or the, the code that's going to be on the page to construct the page. So what we want to do here is create some code. So I'm going to be utilizing Fragment, React Fragment. So what normally needs to happen here is you need to wrap your code here in an outer element, a div or a P or a span or something like that. So you don't need to do that if you use React Fragment. So this is just going to make a, a blank element on the page. So this is why I use React Fragment. So like I said, normally you'd need to wrap all this code up in a div, for example. So this just prevents you having to do that. Um, so I'm going to bring in the um, CSS baseline and then I'm then going to make my component. So let me just drop the whole component in so you can see what's going on. So here I've made the app bar and then I've got some attributes here, position, color, elevation and class name. So notice that this class name is called app bar and that's what we're connecting here to this app bar. So that just brings in that other style. And then I have a toolbar. So my toolbar here is going to be called this is the main application. So this is the outer app bar. This is the um, nav bar, if you like, if you're in Bootstrap. And this is the container inside. So inside of that nav bar, I'm going to place just um, the name of the blog. So it's just going to be called Blog Me Up. And you can see here that we've created a variant. So this is going to be in a H6 style um, text. And the color is going to be inherited from wherever the color gets inherited from. And no wrap. So this is a no wrap is a um, a flexbox because um, I think this is built on flexbox. So no wrap means that it's not going to wrap. This element isn't going to wrap onto the next line. Okay, so there's loads of different technologies here being mixed up here, and I appreciate that if you don't come back from a front end um, environment, this can be a little bit more complicated. Um, but hopefully that gives you a guidance. So no wrap is to do um, with flexbox. Have a look at no wrap. A variant here is just referring to H6, so this is just a H6 text, so the size of a H6, um, H1 being the largest size and H6 being a, um, a smaller size text, so that's how we're controlling the text size. Okay. Okay, then finally we just need to export that, so we'll go ahead and export. Right, so that pretty much is all that we need, except for the code error here. Right like that so that should now be in place um, at the end here um, it's a bit bizarre so we need parentheses okay so that looks like it's all good now so that creates our header so let's have a look to see what that looks like so before you go ahead and run the server you'll probably find that you need to just finish off your index.js page so I've gone ahead and just uh, added this line here, the react dom.render. So it's just going to render all this out. Uh, and then the I've included the service worker down here and there's a note here. This is the, the this is just the default text that you'll read when you create a new application. So I've just placed that down there for now. We might utilize it later in this series. So um, there we go. So what we should have now if we go back into our page. Now I have also just so we have something in the page. In our app.js, I've just uh, pressed Control and Z, and just taken, brought back the code that was originally in the app.js file. So if we go back and go have a look now on our page, you can now see we have our nav bar at the top here, and we also then just have the app page here. So let's go ahead and create a footer. So what you should now have is that construct. We've got the blog or the navigation bar, the header at the top here. We have the app page or component in the middle. And then we've got the footer at the bottom here. So you can see I've gone ahead and created the footer already. But you can see how this comp these components are going to be constructed or these um, views are going to be constructed here. 
So what's going to change ultimately is just this middle section. So let's go ahead and just create our footer. So I've gone ahead and built this already. Uh, it follows the same pattern. I brought in some of the different uh, material UI components. I've then created some custom styling to write the footer. And you can see that these probably make sense if you're familiar to HTML, CSS, border at the top, margin top, padding top, padding bottom. Um, we've got some break points. So if you're familiar to bootstrap and break points, this is where the page is going to move from say a full screen page to maybe smaller chunks as you go into a smaller screen. So that just breaks it up a little bit. So this, the code from material UI, just the footer, like I showed you earlier. And then we've got some functions. So notice that the functions on the page have been broken up. So we've got the copyright section. We've got um, these, these, this data that's been set up for the footer. So you can see here, we've got this array of data here that we're gonna bring in. So this does help, if you read through this code, this does um, give you an idea of how you can utilize and set up your code as new developers to React, most definitely, and the different uh, ways of coding. And like I said, developing your code. So here's some data. And I guess here what's happening is that you're structuring your code and you're separating your components. So it makes it easier for you to edit the text it makes it easier for you to look at different sections of your um, your elements or your page. Um, so you can look at different elements individually. Uh, it just makes it easier for you to potentially manage your page. And down here, what we have is the code here for returning. We've got another React fragment here, and this is the actual footer. So you can see it's um, been set in a container, a nice little container here, and we've got a grid. And you can see here they've got container space in, so we're spacing this by four. So there should be four um, columns potentially here, justifying space evenly. Um, so they should be nicely spaced evenly. And you can see here what we have is this footer map here. So what's happening here is that for each row or so each column of our grid, we're uh, outputting this text here. So this is, this is going to represent different columns, these items here. So this is a way of just outputting different columns. So each column will have a URL. Uh, inside of that is going to be some items. So you can see here, there's two loops here. We've got this outer loop for each column. And then we've got this inner loop that's going to output the different individual items. And this is going to be worth if you're not familiar to this type of code, just to study this, because you could definitely utilize this later in other templates. So just to confirm here, we're looping through each item of this list, of this array, these items here. And then we're looping through every individual item. So we've got map and then the item. So every item here is going to be looped through and outputted in each um, column. Okay, so at the bottom here, we've got this box and then we're bringing in the copyright. That's where we're bringing in this um, function here, this component here. Um, that's gonna be added there. And that pretty much makes up that page. So when we go back, we export, of course, when we go back, um, to our page, you can see that that's what we're developing here. So I apologize for all the setup. We haven't even touched um, the API yet. Um, so that's pretty much all the setup that we're going to need for this point. And now we can focus on the API. So before we can connect to our Django API service, we need to just make some more configurations within the Django server or the Django application. So I'm back here in the Django application. And the first thing that I need to do is to install Django core headers. So I've gone ahead and installed or pip installed the Django core headers here. This is the application. And you can see that this is a, a nice succinct way of explaining what this does. This allows in browser requests to your Django application from other origins. So remember that our Django application is working on a 127.001 colon 8000, and our other application, our React application works on the 3000 port. So if you imagine online, um, that's slightly different. So the cores package here just allows us to connect to our dear DRF service, our um, RESTful service through different origins or from different origins. 
So here in this case, it's going to be the case of users somewhere on the web is going to connect to our application. So we can control who can connect to our application through our core headers here. So let's just go ahead and build this out. So we've installed it. And so we pip installed it and it tells us now we need to just add it to the uh, settings. So let's go ahead into our core, go into our settings and then just add it to the installed apps at the top here. So we can do that. And then second, we need to just do the middleware or just add the middleware. So we've got this cores middleware and it specifically tells us that it needs to be as high as possible in the middleware. Otherwise, there might be some complications. It may not work properly. So we need to just make sure it's above the Django middleware common, common middleware. So let's just go back into the settings and then just go down to our middleware here. And you can see we've got the common common middleware just there. So we're just going to place it just above that there. So that should be okay. And then the final configuration for this tutorial is that we just need to go down and set out the origin. So the cause allowed origin. So this is a list of all the uh, different servers or origins that can connect to this server. So let's go back into the uh, settings. And we're just going to add this at the bottom here. So let's just remember that our server, or at least our React server, is running on port 3000. So let's just allow that. And that's pretty much it for a default uh, configuration for cores and all that we're going to need here. We will add to this in further and later tutorials, but for now, I think that's all we need. So you just need to make sure that the service is running. So let's just run the server, otherwise we can't connect to it. And that's ready now to, to work for us. So we can now connect to Django. So let's go back into the application here, the React application. And let's now just configure our app component. So let's now go ahead and we're gonna head into our app component here. And we're just gonna write this piece of code. So this is just gonna be an example connection so that we can show or we can demonstrate how we can connect to our API. So here we're not using any uh, modules or dependencies here, we're just using React here. And you can see that we import React in and then we go ahead and we then create this new component. And you can see here, we create a variable here, uh, API URL. So we then add the URL, which is um, obviously 12701-8000 API, that's our Django server um, API and the endpoints, and then we create a fetch. So we input uh, the API URL. So we put, take that into the fetch, and then we go ahead and we just get collect all the data. This is, uh, we collect all the data uh, in a JSON format. So now it's in response here. And then we just pass all that data over and we put it into data. And then we go ahead and just console log the data. So that's all that's happening here. We're just passing the data, we're fetching the data, then we're passing it over um, to response, and then we're passing it over to data, and then we can now log it out. So we can have a look at the console and it should be printed out. So that's pretty much it really for a, a real basic connection to a, an API. So let's go ahead now and see if this works. So the server should be on, uh, refresh, and then I go into the console and you'll notice straight away that there's an error. So I've simulated this error here, so error SSL protocol error. So the reason why I've simulated this error because I've seen many students before have this problem. Um, it is a common problem, at least um, I've seen it to be a common problem. So SSL, let's just remember, if you see SSL, this has got to do something with the fact that um, SSL is the problem, right? So what is SSL? Well, secure socket layer. So that might be to do something to do something with HTTP S. So we need to remember that sometimes we can get mixed up in our browser here. We, we can use HTTP um, colon slash slash, or we can use the secure version. So we need to ensure that we're using the right version here. Now, if we go into our REST framework here, you'll notice that this isn't using HTTP S. This is just using HTTP. So let's go ahead and try it out. You can see that's working. 
So we're not using the secure version in our server. So we just need to make sure that we're pointing um, to the right, in the right direction here. So you can see here, I've used an S. So let's remove the S and because we're not using secure in this case, the SSL component. So let's now go back into our application. We refresh and you can now see what we receive is just an error failed. So we are using HTTP uh, colon 8,000 and now we're getting a net error failed. So that's a completely different error. So if we read above here, it says access to fetch uh, blah, blah, blah from origin blah, blah, blah has been blocked by the core policy. Right, so that is a, should be a simple one to solve because it's just telling us here that cores has actually blocked us from accessing the database from the data. So now let's just go back into our Django application. Let's go to the settings. Uh, we'll just navigate to the bottom here. Now you can see here that we have allowed HTTP uh, colon slash slash one two seven zero zero one colon three thousand. So all we need to do now is just check. And you can see here, we're not using that, we're using localhost. So although behind the scenes in networking terms, localhost, the word localhost is being resolved to 127001, in actual fact, we need to actually type in localhost. So let's do that. And server restarts. So let's go back now into the browser and refresh. And there we go. So this indicates we've received some data. If I look into here, you can see that we've got the first item that's in our um, Django server. So we've actually collected the data and now it's been returned to our React application. So what we obviously need to do now is get that on the screen and output it and then just do some other components here. Remember at, um, at the start of the tutorial, I think I said that we're going to have a further step or initial step whereby we create an application which uh, runs a loading screen first and uh, before the data loads. So if the data loads instantly, it's not really gonna show it, but if the data takes a couple of seconds, we're just gonna have a loading screen to tell the user that we're fetching the data and it's taken a couple of seconds. So let's go ahead now and build this out. So before we go ahead and build this uh, further, I just want to point you to this article here from smashingmagazine.com. So I'm always looking out for different ways of uh, setting out and defining and structuring React application. And you can imagine it does evolve. Um, it does change. People use different methodologies, etc. Now, this is a particularly good uh, article here, which um, I do recommend you have a read through. And it does support what we're doing here. And what I've done is I've taken the essence of this tutorial, uh, the workflow that this gentleman has applied within his application. I've just replicated that, um, replicated the structure of the way he's working because I've thought it's particularly interesting the way of structuring out this application. It does look a little bit more advanced um, than if you're if you are new to React. This is going to look a little bit advanced, but I think this is something that you can work towards uh, and is an interesting way, interesting way of developing this particular application. Of course, there's many ways we can build this out now. So I thought this would be good to, to support you in this development. Okay, so let's start from scratch again in the app. So let's go ahead and import React. We're gonna use the state. So we import all that in, and then we go ahead and we import the app, uh, CSS file. Maybe we want to add some CSS for this particular component. So we can do that. And then we import the post. So this component here is gonna be utilized to loop through the data that's returned from the API and put it onto the screen. So we're gonna, in this component later on, just add some styling and loop through all the data and output it onto the screen. Then we have the post loading component. So this component here is going to be utilized for loading. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna to connect to an API um, it might take a couple of seconds in some instances. Obviously, we're just using the local host, so you're probably not going to see this in action, although I, I will make sure you can see it is working. Uh, so we're going to load this component. Now, I did call it post loading. So uh, let's just make sure. Yeah, but we imported that in. So this component here is going to run before or while we're collecting the data. 
And then once we collected the data, we'll then see the post component. Right, so now we've done that, let's go ahead now and create a new app here, a new function here, it's called app. And you can see what we're doing is we're setting out the state. We want two items in the state. So what we're doing here is we're adding two items. So this first item here, we're gonna store all the data that gets returned from our API. And secondly, we've got this loading. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell the application when the data is being collected, the loading is gonna be true. Therefore, post loading component is gonna show. Once we collected the data, we're gonna change this state back to false. When it is false, it's then going to show the post component. That's the deal here. So you can see here in actual fact, there's a number of things going on here. Not only are we just setting out the state here, but we've got this, what probably can be described as this higher order component. And you can see here, we're wrapping this component around the post component. So this is the essence, uh, an interesting point about this particular approach here, in that we're going to essentially run this post loading component and the post loading component over here, and then we're wrapping it around the post component. So within the post loading component, essentially we're gonna check the state, and then if, we're gonna create an if statement, um, if the loading equals um, false, then we're gonna run the post component. So by wrapping the post loading component around the post component, it then just allows us then to integrate the post component within an if statement almost, so we can check the state and if the state is true, then we're still gonna keep loading. If um, the state is false, then we've got the data and therefore we're gonna run the post component. Okay, so hopefully this is going to unfold shortly, uh, but next up, we're going to actually then set out our connection to the, set out the connection to our API. So here we're gonna be, be utilizing use effect. So the best way to explain why this is being used or how this is being utilized is to understand some of the different lifecycle methods in React. So essentially what use effect is doing here is, is essentially utilizing or doing the lifecycle method component did mount and component did update at the same time. So effects, so use effect. So um, here essentially this is saying doing multiple things. So here you can see when, for example, component did mount, we are essentially trying to build a connection to our API. But as we know, what we're trying to do is we're gonna load a component. And then when we've collected all the data, we're then going to update, update the state and then show additional components. So remember we're wrapping this component, the post component within the post loading component. So this method, allows us to perform those um, actions all in one instead of building a component did mount and then potentially a component did update. So if that doesn't make sense, this is partly why I was directing you to this article here, which goes over a very similar um, approach to what I'm showing you here. Like I said, this was inspired from this approach and this is particularly why I selected this. So. Uh, this takes you into utilizing use effect in, I think, a very interesting way. And it would be interesting for you to read that and understand a little bit more about how to use it if you're not familiar with it. So uh, we finish this off here by returning a simple element here. Class name is going to be app. And then this is just going to show a h1 tag latest post. And then we're going to run our post loading component here. So we're going to pass across some data. So is the loading data. So we're gonna pass over is loading um, equals the app state loading. So we're gonna pass that over uh, and then we're gonna pass over also the post data. So that's gonna be passed over to our component, post loading component here. So let's now go inside the post loading component and set this out. So this is how it's gonna look like. We import React. Then we create a new function. We're gonna call this post loading and we bring in all the data into components. And then we're gonna return the function uh, post loading component is loading and all the props that are needed, all the data moved into there. And then we're gonna run an if statement. So essentially here, what we're saying is if the data is still loading, so is loading, 
Now let's just go back to our app here. Remember that we're passing in um, is loading. So we're getting the state about whether we're loading the data or not. So app state loading and we're passing it into is loading. So if we go back into loading here, we're saying that if this is true, so if, um, sorry, not true. So we've got the not. So if this is not true, if this equals false, so if we're not loading data, we're going to return the component, in this case, the post component, and that's going to show all the data. So if that isn't the case, well, we're just going to return the text here that says we are waiting for the data to load. That's it. So we've got two options. We're going to either load the post uh, component or we're just going to load some text that says we are waiting for the data to load. So let's just finish that off by exporting that. And what we should have now is a loading page. So let's just go ahead and access our app here. So let's just uh, ruin this link here um, so that we don't actually get the data. And let's go back into our application and let's just see this working. So you can see that we've got this invalid expected string for built-in components, okay? Um, you're likely forgot to export your components from the file. Okay, so that makes it easy for me to understand. And it looks like we're in the index page here. Okay, so it looks like we've potentially got a problem there. So let's go ahead and have a look. So I've exported this app. Let's go into my index. Looks like I'm exporting my routing. So that looks okay. So the problem is here is I'm trying to load the component, the post component and it doesn't really exist. There's nothing there. So if we remove this line of code for now, uh, let's just see this in action. So if we go back to the page here, you can see here we've got a message here. We are waiting for the data to load. So clearly it's working okay. Uh, this is our loading page. So now we just need to go ahead and now build our post component. So I'm just gonna throw all the code on here and uh, you can see it's quite a lengthy piece of code here potentially. So let's just go from the top. Uh, you can see that we've imported React and we're utilizing uh, custom styles here. So we've got that in. So this is just the material UI like in previous components. And like in previous components, we add in all of the different components that we're going to need from the material UI. And then we create some styles. So here you can see we've got a style here, a padding top for the card media. We've got a link uh, style, card header style here. We've got some post title style and a post text style. And then we go ahead and then actually build our component. So the component that we're trying to build is actually easier to see it first. This is why I did this. If I just refresh this, um, I just need to go into the index and just make sure I change the, oh, sorry, the, the app, sorry. Let's just change, make sure that's okay. Okay, so let's just refresh the page. Doesn't seem to be working. We've done something wrong here potentially. Um, so I was expecting that just to load up. So let's just make sure. Okay, because we've not done this here. So we've added it back into the post loading page. So now we should be able to load everything up. So if you remember in our Django application, our Django REST API, we've only got one item. This is why you can see one item here, but this is what we're trying to build. So this is the uh, post component this is what it's doing if we add more components it's going to make a list of three across and then it's going to go below so we're making a nice little grid here so now you kind of see what we're building if i go back into the post this is going to potentially make a little bit more sense so remember the react fragment is just going to allow us to not have to necess the necessity to um, use an element to wrap everything up we've then got a container so a container is just a a, an element on the page that's uh, styled in a particular way. We can use a max width, MD, component is gonna be called main. So that's just a simple container component from Material UI, which is similar to Bootstrap if you're familiar with that. And then we've got a grid. So now we're gonna build a grid. So this is another component from uh, the Material UI. And you can see this is the outer grid here. And then we add items to the grid. So we add elements to the grid. So what we want to do now is we take the post data that's returned and we're using map. What we're going to do is we're going to loop through that data now and we're going to return this. So this is the loop start. Everything inside of the loop is an individual instance of the data that's returned from the database. 
So if we had four items or four posts in our Django database, our REST API, then it would return four items and output four items, or this would loop through four times. So this code here is gonna loop through the amount of times that you have posts in your data that's returned. So we're gonna build a grid. You can see that it's XS, so X to small, MD4. So this is the size that it's gonna be when the screen scales up and down. XS refers to a small screen. So on a mobile view, this grid is just gonna be full width. Whereas when we go up to the medium size screen, um, that might be, a, you need to check the manual there, the actual um, size of the width of the browser that needs to be to be there, but it's gonna be four. So this is using a four, a 12 column system like Bootstrap. So it's, we're gonna build here a three column uh, system. So then we have the card. So card is similar to Bootstrap again, if you're familiar with that, we're gonna build a card and we're just now mapping this all out. So at the top of our card, we're just grabbing an image from uh, a API image service online. And then we get the card content. So what we want first is to output the title. So remember, in our Django application, we have, if we can get back to that, we have, we're sending across particular data. Now, if we go into our API here in our serializer, we can see that what we're sending across is an ID, title, author, excerpt, content, status. So that's what we're returning from our API. So that's the elements that we can select um, from our API and output it onto the page. So you can see here, what I've done is I've taken the post data and I've, drill down to the title and I'm outputting the title. So I've used this substring here just to um, limit the amount of text that gets displayed so that I can nicely create boxes that are nicely uniformed on the page. So that goes in and then we go ahead and just output the excerpt. And again, I've just limited the amount of text that you can see on the page and then some dot, dot, dots. Of course, you can do this in a particular, in a different way. This is just for um, showcasing this particular tutorial. So you can see we've got that and then the card component ends. That's our card compo component and the outer card and then the grid. So that's pretty much all you'll see in there. Uh, I think that explains just about all of that. And we've obviously got all the styling here, which um, just adds a little bit more to it. This is fairly straightforward if you're used to CSS, which I'm assuming that you are, so font size, text align and so on. So now we've got that. If you're unsure, the class is card, class is card content. That just matches the classes that are being defined up here, card, header, and so on. So now we've got that in place. You can now see that we're returning the data. Now, obviously, if I go into my API and if I were to now add a new entry, so I just add a new entry here. So uh, admin is the author, add some content. Status needs to be published, otherwise it won't work, and then press post. And now I've got two items. So if I go back to my API here, uh, or just uh, if I go back to my uh, API, you can now see I've got two items being returned from the database. So now I can go in and have a look again at my application, and there we go. So now I have two items being returned back from my API. So don't forget that these images are coming from an API service online. So they aren't being generated by our service yet. We will have a tutorial where we'll be handling images, etc., from our API. Okay, so just a final walkthrough here, of what's happening now we've got all the code in place. So you can see here, we've got this component called post loading. That component is being loaded right here in the return. So we've got that, then we have a state. So we define state data, loading and post. So by default, loading is false. So what's gonna happen, this page is gonna load up. It's going to set the app state to true. That's what's gonna happen originally. And then what's gonna happen is we're gonna try and collect data from the database. So while that has, is happening, we're actually returning this and we're loading the post loading. So that's happening at the same time. This is partly why we're utilizing use effect. Okay, so that's happening at the same time. So what you now see on the screen potentially is the post loading where it says we're trying to load the data. So when the data actually then gets returned from our API, it then gets updated in the state. So here you can see that we set the state loading to false and then we add all the data that's being returned post post. Um, so remember we're getting all the data, we're returning that into post 
and then we're going to add that to our state. So that's going to now have all the data that's been returned back from our API. So when that happens, we then get the uh, trigger that then sends to the post loading. Uh, and then at this point, the if statement here then returns true or false, sorry. So now the is loading is false. So which means our new component, our post component will load up and display the data on the page. So that's a, a walkthrough of what's happening here. And of course, if is loading is true, then we're just going to show this text here. So I welcome you again to the Django DRF and React Building a Simple blog series. This is the first tutorial. Thank you very much for going through the first tutorial. Uh, in the later tutorials or the next tutorials, we'll be looking at a range of different aspects. So the next one is all about uh, permissions. So we'll go through different permissions. And what we're going to do is just add on, add more code onto our application, our React application, and also our Django application. So like building the blog series, if you've watched that, we'll just continually add items to it. If you have any suggestions or things that you want to see, then please just ask. And we'll try and build that into this series. So hopefully you enjoyed this first component of this series. And hopefully I'll see you in the next tutorial.